So here we are again back in the lab, and here we have both of the Nexus switches that we deployed in an earlier lesson, the one we did via GUI and the one we did manual. So I'll just kind of collapse that guy because we're going to be looking at the GUI configuration. Everything that you need to do is done via the command line, or actually you can also do it if you want a GUI through, or a web interface via Cisco's DCNM, Data Center Network Manager product. It is a separate product outside of the Nexus. Uh, 1000V, it's used for managing a lot of different things, Nexus switches, MDS fiber channel switches, things like that. Some of those devices you have to license for use with DCNM. I believe the 1KV, it is a free license. The times that I've deployed that, I believe it's a free license. So that's an option. But everything we'll be doing will be done via the command line because that's kind of the common denominator for all installations. So I'll go ahead and open PuTTY, give it the IP of the VSM, .4. Login is the admin account and the password I gave it. So we'll go ahead and expand that. We can see this is the GUI switch there. Common commands, one thing that people do, if you want to look at the version of switch, do a show version, and you'll see it here. It is 151151. 151. Uh, you can see the startup files here. You'll see one for each supervisor. I'll show you that in a second. But it shows you the base startup files, just so you know if you reboot the switch what it's going to start up in. Things like CPU and memory is not a big deal since these are virtual appliances, but you can also look at your uptime. If you want to see if the modules are running, you can do show module. You have tab completion here, so type in enough. If it doesn't have enough, it'll give you what your options are and you can keep going. We have two modules here, the primary or active VSM and the standby VSM. It's a good thing that they both show up. It means the control VLAN communication is working and they see each other. We can show system redundancy status, redundancy status, and we'll see the one we're logged into as the primary. Uh, operationally, this primary, and he's also set to be the primary. So hopefully, if you boot him at the same time, he will always be primary. Uh, not unusual to see operational primary and administrative to be secondary if you've had to flip the VSMs. Redundancy mode is high availability. State is active with HA standby and the other soup is in standby mode, so that's what we want to see. Next, if you want to see the configuration, we do show running config, and here you go. Starting at the top, a couple of things, version again, no feature telnet. So one thing that NXOS does over the older iOS software that runs on Cisco devices is you, not every feature is enabled. What I mean there is, you know, basically with iOS, everything was always running whether it was configured or not. NXOS is different. You have to enable some things. Some things are on by default, but a lot of things are not. Reason for that is less CPU use, less memory, less attack surface, all sorts of things. So if you want to turn on Telnet, you have to enable that feature. And you do that through the feature commands. First you go to configuration mode, config terminal, or what you'll see a lot of people do, comp T, and then you use the feature command. If you want to see what's enabled already or disabled, you can do show feature and it'll show you if it's enabled. So things like DHCP snooping we'll talk about earlier or later in a lesson is disabled by default. The HTTP server, you know that is the server, I, I showed you that in the install where you can go to a web page for the switch. You pull down like the XML file, the certificate file, as well as the VIMs. You can disable that for security reasons. LACP is off by default. So when we talk about port channels in a minute, I'll probably forget to mention this when I talk about LACP, but you need to enable that. NetFlow, you need to enable that. All sorts of stuff, but that's how you do it. So if you want to enable Telnet, you type feature Telnet. If you want to turn it back off, no feature Telnet. But again, that's just how you kind of go through. Uh, word of caution, this bites me every so often. If a feature is disabled, all related commands are disabled. Uh, what that means is you'll type a command that should work, but it'll say no command found or, you know, whatever. It'll say invalid command. It doesn't say invalid command. That feature isn't enabled. It just says invalid command. So you want to make sure not to run yourself in circles trying to figure out why something doesn't enable like LACP when, in fact, the feature is disabled or turned off. You need to turn it on, then those commands magically work. Sometimes I'll do that, and 10 minutes later, I'm like, oh, that's why it didn't work. I didn't have the feature enabled. Well, yeah, don't do that to yourself. But that's how you enable features. So we'll go show running again. Let's see. Username. 
This is the uh, locally created admin user. You can create other admin accounts. You can also enable your own AAA for TACAX or RADIUS. But admin, password 5, this is the encrypted password and the role which is network admin. Then you have your message of the day banner, your SSH key information, IP domain lookup. You give a DNS server to look up IPs and information. Host name, which is also your switch name in vCenter. Your SNMP server information, by default, it has an SNMP server of admin again. We'll talk a little bit about that later, I think, in the NetFlow lesson where we can enable SNMP. But again, that's just like any other Cisco device. The SNMP config is the same, so I'm not going to go too much into that. You have what's called a VRF. This doesn't mean a whole lot in the 1000V because it's not a Layer 3 uh, routing switch. So it's really just the routing table for the management interface. So right now it's just got one route, which is the default to the gateway. You could add other static routes if you wanted. If this was a full-on Layer 3 Nexus 5500 with Layer 3 module or Nexus 7000, you will probably have several VRFs, one for management, and then you may have others for different routing tables. But for the Nexus, we only have one. Next are the VLANs we know about, VLAN 1 slash 1,5. We'll talk more about these. The reason it's in there twice is once to actually create them, and then it does a second command to actually give them names and other configs, but since there aren't any, it just looks like it ran it twice. Port channel, we'll talk a bit about this as well, but basically the standard or default load balancing mechanism if you don't specify a source MAC hashing. We talked about MAX ports a little bit in the last lesson when we were talking about config, but when you create a port group, by default, it has 32 ports. So when you add VMs, virtual NICs, into a port group, when you get to number 33, it kicks back an error and says, hey, you're out of ports. People usually freak out. They call me up, and I have them run a command. Well, now you can actually set the default up front. Now, this only takes effect from any port groups going forward. So if I already had five of them created, if I set it to 64, it's not going to go retroactively change those others. But since we haven't created any, I'm going to up it. I think that's too low. So you go again, we're in configure mode. You can always type where to figure out where you're at or look at the prompt and you'll know you're in config mode. Do port profile, default max ports. Don't go nuts and set this to like 1024. Do a reasonable size because there is a number of max ports you can do across the whole switch. By default, it's 8K, 8192. You can up that, but don't go crazy. I usually do 128 or 256. So I'll just do 256 right here. And again, also you can override that on a port group by port group basis. So I can go in and specify each one what the max ports are. But you'll see the change took effect there. Next, there are two port profiles already created. One is the type Ethernet physical uplink and one is VEthernet, which is your virtual uh, configuration for port groups. It's called unused or quarantine uplink and unused or quarantine via Ethernet. And if you notice the description, do not use. These are used internally by the switch. If for some reason a physical uh, NIC uplink on a vSphere host or a VM's NIC in a virtual side becomes quarantined, basically the port profile they were in for some reason no longer exists, yet the config says they're still in there, you'll see them get dropped into these. So don't manually put anything in there. But if you see things in there, it means they need to be rehomed into other port groups. Also, if you hit space when you're in a list like this, it'll go page by page. If you hit enter, it'll go line by line. The next thing is this VDC information. VDC, VDC stands for Virtual Device Context, and this is something like the VRF. It doesn't have a lot of meaning here on the 1000V. But if you have a Nexus 7000, 7009, 10, 18, one of those big guys, you can actually get a license and do what are called virtual device contacts where you can take one of those big switches and carve it up into smaller virtual switches. Right now you can do up to four, but the cool thing is they are almost like separate physical switches. If I have a port in VDC1 and another port that I say belongs to VDC2, there is no way internal to the switch to route or switch frames between those two ports. I have to plug a cable into one port and the other end in the other port. They act like separate switches. Nexus 1000V, we don't have that option. Everything is just configured under VDC1. And really, the only thing you worry about here are just some of these normal minimums and maximums. No big deal.